Hello and welcome to NewsClick. Today, we look at the latest developments in the trade war the United States launched against China last year and which escalated recently with the sanctions on telecommunications manufacturer Huawei. To talk more about this, we have with us Prabir Purkayastha. Hello, Prabir. Prabir, so we have seen that China is now planning a list of unreliable foreign companies which basically damage the interests of Chinese companies. And this basically also indicates that China is not going to take the actions against Huawei lying down and it's actually going to, the state is going to support Huawei as well. So uh, to start out with, how do you see the, in, before we go into the details of the technical details, so to speak. So at a general level, how do you see things spanning out in the next couple of? I think we are no longer in the phase of a trade war. Trade war is where it started. Right. But with the 5G Huawei and later on with the sanctions list, entities list, as uh, they seem to be calling it, which seems a very innoc innocent uh, nomenclature, shall we say. But it means a whole host of technologies plus a lot of components, software systems are no longer available for Huawei. Now, Huawei is one of the biggest Chinese companies, particularly in the area, area of telecom and uh, mobile phones, servers, a whole bunch of equipment. So I don't think the Chinese can afford for it to sink. Right. So therefore, this is a kind of crossing of the Rubicon, if you will, where we are escalating beyond what are trade sanctions against a set of goods. Of course, it might have violated the WTO framework, but leaving all of it out, we're now getting into what is essentially the real battle that is taking place between China and the United States, which is over the technology markets of the future. And the fact that for the first time, the Chinese seems to be threatening the lead that America and its allies had, the United States and its allies had over the tech space. And 5G technology was only a start of that. But there is also the threat of artificial intelligence and also the entire, shall we say, the digital uh, sphere in which uh, Huawei was also maintaining its lead or at least enlarging its capabilities in various areas. So I think Huawei is only a test case and the real battle is over the digital sphere and the entity of the digital sphere in which the 5G was just the start with the cell phones also coming under attack essentially and that's come under attack because of the sanctions for both software and hardware, I think the battle has really become much larger. Chinese have indicated two possible lines of attack. One which they've already indicated is the their equivalent of the entities list, which is unreliable suppliers list, those who have accepted American sanctions and therefore are not fulfilling what they think are contractual obligations. And the other, which they also have raised at least the flag, that they could retaliate in a different way and not in the electronic space or the digital space, but they could retaliate against rare earths, of which almost 80% of the manufacture is done by Chinese companies. And though other sources of rare earths do exist in different parts of the world, to make it operational within the short time, which is what would be required, is also going to be difficult. So that could in turn dislocate also the United States. So I think we are really sh seeing uh, both the breakdown of the, shall we say, the post-WTO order. We are also seeing the start of tech wars, which we haven't seen. And we could foreseeably see the breakup of what is called the global supply chain, which assumes that supplies are available seamless, seamlessly over you know, a number of countries. I think that could also break down. And you know, the United States and the Chinese, the economies, are tightly interlocked. They exchange a lot of goods with each other, services with each other. There is a lot of round tripping equipment which comes from the United States, is assembled in China, goes back to the United States, iPhone being a part of that. So this breakup of the supply chain is going to affect both. So I think we are in that, shall we say, uncharted waters of a trade war, tech war, and also a breakup of the global supply chain, along with, with the trade war, the dismantling, virtually, 
official, I say the WTO order, because if China and the United States, the two biggest ones, fight in the global market in a trade war, the WTO really has very little meaning. Right. And one of the things we looked at at NewsClick is that how this phase is a, a new one because it marks not only locking Huawei out of certain, uh, say, areas markets. of the markets, but also blocking its core supplies as well. And a lot of this is actually centered around hardware, so uh, chip manufacturers. So could you talk a bit about what are the key players and how are they going to be affected by the scenario? You know, when it started, it appeared that Google was going to be the key problem. Mm -hmm. And that uh, because the Android operating system uses, of course, Google's Android core, there was always a possibility you could already use an Android fork right. and develop your own uh, Android version. The problem that was foreseen as a key one was the fact that Google has its Play Store. So a lot of the key features which make the mobile phone so useful are locked out of the Android core, but available only to the Google Play Store. Therefore, it becomes a kind of cloud function, yeah. which again, Google controls. So in some sense, the lock-in of technology and software moved from the cell phone itself or the computer as Microsoft did earlier, but moved into the cloud, which again Google controlled because of the cloud control it exercised. So this was seen to be the problem. There it appeared that Huawei has various options, that it could A, in the Chinese market it is not affected because Google is not there anyway. anyway. It could use the Chinese apps, uh, reskin them, making more friendly for third other other countries, not Europe, not United States, but at least other countries. And thirdly, it could also move its entire ecosystem, create a parallel ecosystem, which anyway Apple has done, which uh, Amazon is trying, and which therefore could be accelerated if Huawei also comes into this market and tries and develops its own ecosystem, which would affect also Google in the long run. So these are all options available. But the latest round of sanctions, which has one unforeseen uh, consequence, at least we hadn't seen a lot, of, a lot of this, we had thought they're vulnerable to Qualcomm chips not being available, Intel chips not being av available, which of course would impact their uh, 5G manufacturing capability, but also certain kind of production system they have, which is the, basically the servers, other hardware, including of course the cell phone itself. But what has now transpired, the ARM uh, processors, which is owned by SoftBank, a Japanese company. It's essentially a, started as a British company, still is headquartered in Britain. That has come under the notice of US entities list uh, on uh, for Huawei because it appears that more than 25% of its software comes from the United States. And therefore, the entities list says any uh, quantity above 25% of U.S. content has to be also brought onto this right. uh, entities list uh, discipline, so to say. So ARM has said it is discontinuing supply of any fresh ARM uh, software. Uh, I'll come to what it means, design, software, etc., to Huawei. So effectively, what it has transferred still remains, but any fresh intellectual property transfers in terms of licenses and software to develop the next generation of processes is not there. Now, before we come to what that really is, one must understand that almost everybody in the world today is shifting away from chips which are manufactured by A, B, or C companies. Intel still remains a very large supplier of chips, but the processor chips earlier, AMD was a supplier, has almost been given up by everybody. What they have done is they have taken the ARM architecture, the ARM software, as it were, and built their core processes around that. So it's almost entirely ARM which dominates today what is called the system on a chip platforms. And almost all the cell phones have this system on a chip which is a variant of the ARM processor. So Qualcomm, which also manufactures its uh, signal system on a chip, it's built this uh, entire uh, set of chips on, on the ARM processors. There are 
uh, Samsung has built again on the ARM process and Huawei has also built its core system around the ARM's processor. Apple also builds it around the ARM processor, but of course Apple has its own foundry, so to say, that it takes it, builds its own processors, it has its core design capabilities and that operates like a closed system. So if we take all of this without the ARM processors, what happens to Huawei is the key problem that is there and we can discuss that a little, uh, little more in detail. But this seems to be a kind of existential threat to uh, Huawei because if they do not get the further versions of ARM processors, then they have to develop a capability alone, which nobody else seems to have done, which is actually this build a series of new processors. So that is the key bottleneck that it is facing. And they might have stockpiled. They already have license for the current generation, which can go in for some more time. So it is no longer a question of stockpiling chips. The question is, will they, they will, will they get frozen in time, as it were, right. not being able to develop cell phones, mobile phones, on the next generation of ARM processors? Mm -hmm. Because ARM essentially is saying that we will not be able to supply any new generation of software to you. Right. So will it be kind of stasis for Huawei? Mm -hmm. Because how to get around this is something that we have to really see. So is there a way for Huawei to actually, uh, say, overcome these restrictions that come out of ARM, uh, say, in imposing these sanctions, so to say, or following these sanctions, so to speak? You know, this is, this is really the imponderable as of now, because Huawei has foreseen, according to its uh, chairman, uh, they have been foreseeing that there will be an attack on Huawei. It's a question of when not if. That's the position they have taken. And certainly after the arrest of the, uh, the CFO, it's been very clear that Huawei was going to, is in the, was in the crosshairs and it was going to come under different kinds of sanctions. So it would be, it would be stupid to think that they have made no preparations. Did they just stockpile chips? Is that the only preparation they made? So now High Silicon, the, basically the body within Huawei, it's a separate company but it's really part of the Huawei group. They have been building the processors for quite some time. So their one of the lead persons in High Silicon, uh, she has come out and said in a note to the company that we have known this is going to happen. We always had a plan B where we would switch completely into our own internal designs. We have kept this as a plan B. Now that this has happened, this will become our plan A. Now, are they whistling in the dark? Were they actually preparing for it? If we look at the budget this high silicon, uh, high silicon has, it is a very large budget which the Huawei was spending. And whether it was only for the purpose of building the chips or other chips or the uh, converting the ARM processors into chips, design into chips, or was it something which also had a second line of defense? We really don't know. They have been, uh, shall we say, experts who have said, no, no, this is all uh, bullshit. They really didn't have anything. They don't really have anything. They face an existen existential crisis. But it also does uh, make us think that maybe they will get a two-year delay. Uh, two years is anyway the time they have because the current generation right. of processors on the which they're going to release their next cell phone, they still haven't released it. But that design they already have, so they have already uh, got the license for that. So I don't think that can be taken away from them. So that will survive in the market for at least a year right. to two years. Right. After which they're, they're in the danger of losing their uh, shall we say, yeah. high end of business. Right. The low end of the business, the middle end of the business still continues. But the high end of the business then could come under right. uh, attack. So that is one part of it that they have about two years. Now, if they don't do anything with the next two years, then we are looking at what people say could be four to five years, in which case Huawei will certainly fall behind. So that is the big, shall we say, question mark. How much uh, advanced they already are in order to be able to switch away from the ARM processor. 
And not only the ARM processor, there are a whole range of other equipment, small, small pieces they might require. So they're building the supply chain. As I said, this also is a threat to the global supply chain. They have to now build a completely safe supply chain for themselves. The European companies who do not have such the threats from the United States, if they don't, that they are, could still do business with China. China is a very huge, big market for them. And therefore, how the other parts of the world will shape up the right. sanctions is to be seen. But I think this is the big open question. Does Huawei, does the Chinese state have the ability right. with the next two years to be able to replace the ARM processors? Two years is a long time. So two years, uh, a lot may happen, including this whole thing going away. Right. But certainly there is this threat that if they don't do anything, then uh, technologically yeah. they will be locked into the past and that will mean that Huawei as a significant player in the international market right. will not be there. Right. And you also mentioned the question of foundries. I believe Taiwan and South Korea have two of the most important foundries. So how do they play into this equation at the same time? Again, at the moment it doesn't look like the, uh, the major silicon foundry which is outside Samsung. Samsung is a competition also. Taiwan and Samsung are the only two companies which right. have the seven nanometer technology today right. to be able to make chips, which means less power uh, consumption, uh, packing more devices onto a chip and so on. So that uh, it doesn't seem is affected. The China Taiwanese company seems to indicate that it is really not affected by US sanctions. So that may not be a problem. Uh, so at the moment, it doesn't look like that there is a threat to the, their ability to get 7 nanometer technology, which is the latest technology in the market, to develop, build its uh, processors and other, t other things, chips, the chipsets that it may require. So that, that seems to be, at the moment, right. safe. But given the strength of the U.S., uh, shall we say, power in the global arena, can they force the Taiwanese, Taiwanese company also to back off? We don't know. So those are all the imponderables in the equation. But you know, the Chinese are also not without any, shall we say, retaliatory capacity. As you talked about, they have built a list of unreliable suppliers. Now already, the chip manufacturers like Qualcomm, Intel and others are likely to lose about $11 billion of what Huawei was purchasing from them. What about the other Chinese companies? So if this, the, the, shall we say, the tech wars go on, I'm not talking about the trade wars. If the tech wars go on, then there is a risk that a huge number of companies would also be affected. They are not retaliating against Apple, which people thought is what they would retaliate against, because at the end of it, at Apple, the value addition in China of Apple is very, very low. Though people think they, the $270 per cell phone goes to Apple, uh, which is the landed cost of the Apple phone in, in the United States. But out of that, only eight and a half or nine dollars is really what uh, China contributes as value add. Most of it is components which have come from other places, including the United States. So that's a bogus uh, argument. And Apple is something that the, a lot of the elite in China like to have, either the iPhone or the Macs. So I think what is more likely is what they've called as unreliable entities. They are in version of the entities list. And if they start looking for alternate suppliers for all of that, which is what I was talking about, the splitting the global supply chain, then American companies are star will start to hurt also. And I can see already the trade predictions, which says entire electronics manufacturing any company which is in that space, don't buy the stocks yeah. because there is a complete uncertain future about, about them. So uncertainty over the global supply chain means uncertainty over procurement and uh, prices. Both are going to continue. So I think China is not without cards. Rare earths is one of them. That, uh, that's something they could retaliate against, which will affect also the US defense programs the space program, so a lot of important programs, including storage batteries and so on. But most of all, I think we are seeing that technological independence is now back on the table. And countries like India, as well as other countries have to, the European Union as well, has to decide that either it remains 
in strategically independent or it joins one block or the other. And if you want to do, you want to retain strategic independence, then it is necessary not only to have economic independence, which almost everybody recognizes, but also technological independence, which is something people thought was some which belonged, belonged to the 19th, maybe first half of the 20th century, but not end, end of the 20th century, not the beginning of the 21st. I think we are back in that range. Thank you, Prabhupada. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click.